Um, okay, well, good morning. My name is Ilyas Mahanna, uh, and I'm an assistant professor in comparative literature here at Brown. On behalf of the Middle East Studies Program and the Digital Islamic Humanities Project, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to what I'm certain <coughs> will be a very interesting day of talks. Distant Reading in the Islamic Archive is the third scholarly gathering we've hosted at Brown in the past three years within the theme of the Digital Islamic Humanities which is a sign signature initiative of the Middle East Studies program. I'd like to thank Bashar Dumani, the director, and Sarah Tobin, the associate director of Middle East Studies, for their unflagging support, as well as Barbara Oberketter, the, the academic pro program coordinator for MES, who has been a key part of the planning for all of our events. A very special word of thanks is due to the dean of the faculty, Kevin McLaughlin, and associate dean, Ann Windham, who have supported this initiative through the Brown Humanities Research and Teaching Fund for three straight years. Two years ago, um, we had um, our inaugural conference called the Digital Humanities and Islamic and Middle East Studies, um, which was in this room, and had uh, was two days of uh, very interesting papers. In your packet today, you should have received a, uh, a little booklet that is um, with the words the Digital Humanities and Islamic Middle East Studies on the front, that is the cover page of a forthcoming edited volume that, that will be coming out in um, January from De Gruyter. And inside, you'll find the table of contents for the papers, most of which, uh, most of them had originated as papers at that 2013 conference, um, including, um, and there's a, a couple others that that we managed to commission, including one uh, by Peter Verkindran and um, Jose uh, Peralta. Um, Peter is here today. And um, so that, and you'll also find my introductory essay to that uh, volume, which kind of introduces, the, which explains what the volume is all about and also says something about the, um, the essays in it. So I encourage you to take a look at that and also to persuade your librarians at your home institutions to purchase the book for your, for your libraries. Um, again, that'll be out in January 2016. Last year's event um, was called Textual Corpora and the Digital Islamic Humanities. That was a two-day event. We had about 35 people, um, and we held it in the Digital Scholarship Lab at Rockefeller Library. Um, that event was uh, a workshop. It was two days of sessions um, run by uh, myself, um, Maxim Romanoff, and uh, Eli Milonas. Um, it was sort of pedagogical sessions on different, different ways of navigating uh, textual corpora. We had a session on GIS, um, Python, regular expressions. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And this year, we're, we've opted to do a symposium, so uh, a little bit more specialized um, on this particular theme of distant reading, which um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna take too much time away from our proceedings, but I thought I would say just a few words about this particular theme. Distant reading is a term, an analytical paradigm, a methodological approach that was born in controversy. Coined in the year 2000 by the Stanford literary critic Franco Moretti in an essay entitled Conjectures on World Literature, the term and the computational approach that it signifies have generated several monographs, articles, symposia, and an enviable number of engagements and interventions in the mainstream press. Within less than a decade and a half, distant reading has gone from being the future of literary studies to the end of literary studies and everything in between. This has been the case at least within the humanity circles frequented by scholars of European and comparative literature, and of course, in the emerging multidisciplinary space of the digital humanities. Outside of these zones, the debates around distant reading and Moretti's method are far less well known. Um, I finished my PhD in 2012. I was on the job market the year before. And I remember being asked um, in you know, interviews, liter literature departments, well, what do you think of Moretti? You know? and, and I didn't know who Moretti was. I had no idea. I came out of a Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations department. And I think my honest answer actually worked in my favor because it, it sort of reassured people who were um, in, in literature departments who are uncomfortable with this idea of distant reading and using computers to comb through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of novels, uh, that I was not going to be you know, one of these computer nerds who was going to come in and start pushing a digital humanities agenda. Little did they know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So anyway, um, the point is that Moretti is infamous in you know, complet circles, in, uh, English, in English departments, French departments, and so on. Uh, he is a, an Italian scholar of European literature. Outside of those zones, he's, that method is not very well known, right? So um, my interest in organizing a symposium on distant reading, the idea of distant reading, and the Islamic archive stems from a suspicion that there is nothing inherently objectionable about the idea of distant reading if it is not held up as the only or even the best way to work with taxes. I say this as someone who spends most of his days doing and teaching close reading. However, I feel that in my own work, computational tools occasionally have afforded me insights into my texts that I would not have otherwise been able to gain. And I suspect that many of the folks in this room um, have had similar experiences. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So uh, rather than get, getting involved in a useless debate about you know, close reading versus distant reading, I think that um, we're in a special position as people who are working in uh, Islamicate uh, literatures and history to not have to, to enter that kind of methodological cul-de-sac and just deal with the virtues of, of an approach that surveys uh, enormous archives alongside um, close reading. So uh, with these thoughts in mind, I, I hope to bring together folks with working with digital methods to see what kinds of common challenges we face. Uh, that's the part, point of the symposium, and I hope that we all come away with some new ideas and connections. Um, just a point of uh, logistical issues. If uh, any of you are on Twitter and want to kind of uh, live tweet some of the uh, papers, which is something we've done in the past, and it's been kind of interesting to see the reaction um, by folks who work outside of Islamicate um, languages, but who are very interested in, in text mining and distant reading. Uh, I think I propose that we just use the hashtag distant reading. Um, speakers will have 20 minutes, and I'm going to be the, the timer, and I'm just going to hold up a sign, uh, five minutes, two minutes, and time's up, just to kind of keep things on pay, pace. I think what we'll do is um, have presentations follow each other, and then we'll just have a discussion after each one, rather than do questions and answers following each paper, if that makes sense. Yeah? OK. So uh, without further ado, our first speaker is David Vishenoff, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Oklahoma. His talk is entitled, A Customizable Exaptive Zap. Is it Zap or Zap? Zap. For Charting Currents of Islamic Discourse Across Multiple Bibliographic and Full Text Datasets. Thank you, Ed, yes. It's um, great to be here, great to see Islamic studies at the forefront, helping to be at the forefront of the, of the digital humanities. Uh, I suspect, like most of you, I did not, and like Ed, yes, did not set out to be a, get into the digital humanities. I got into it sort of by necessity. My first research project was on pre-classical, early Quranic hermeneutics, legal hermeneutics. I completed that whole project using about three shelves of books in Arabic. That was my, my textual universe. Then I decided to move into contemporary Quranic hermeneutics and quickly realized that the literature is being produced in a whole bunch of different languages so fast that I can't even begin to keep track of what's being published. Our libraries here can't keep track of what's being published, much less actually reading it. So I ran into a software developer, the founder of Exaptive, who creates the, which creates Zaps, and uh, got hearing about his work and the uh, uh, doing helping doing research software for medical researchers and such. Realized the big data methods he was using, he said, it could be applied to text analysis too, and to my problems. So we convinced the head of libraries at uh, at the University of Oklahoma, Rick Luce, who's a pretty visionary guy, to um, to sponsor a pilot project, and I get to be the guinea pig researcher for a project that really has applications all across the, all across the humanities. Um, we've been working on it for a couple months. Uh, what we have at the moment is uh, something that looks like now it's on my screen here, but okay. 
something that looks like this. It's not a digital humanities conference if there isn't some That's right. huge yeah. technical issue from the first moment. Try going back to the PC. What's that? Try and plug it. Plug it back in here. I wondered if um, the alt tab in here may have changed my display settings when I switched modes here. See if we don't lose it here. Okay, this is this is the we've been working on this for a couple of months, and we currently have something that uh, will help me find out what literature is out there and begin to map out the discourses that are out there in Quranic hermeneutics or any other topic you want to work on um, using what looks like a traditional library search with some results of titles of books, uh, but also giving some visual clustering and mapping of the. The vocabulary, the principal vocabulary in those books, the most common terms, the, the titles, and the, and the authors, clustering them into groups uh, that, uh, that tend, that of authors or works that tend to cluster around, around certain themes. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that um, interface in a minute here, but first I want to show you where we are trying to, to go. Uh, before I, we started working on this software, I played around with some freely available online visualization, data visualization tools uh, to just see what, what could be done. And I used, as my textual corpus, I used the notes that I took for that first book project. I had about 4,000 note cards that I had created in an access database. And I just you know, ran queries on the database, produced tables of, of notes, <laughs> and uh, ran them into some software. So starting with a few terms, I just queried my database and said, well, Okay, Quran and hermeneutics. What, what, which of my, how many of my note cards involve those terms, and what's the, what's the concept space around those? What are the other terms that, that appear with that? And then, okay, now show me the, the terms and the authors that wrote on those terms. And you can, you, with this tool, VOS Viewer, you can zoom in and you can find your way around here. And there is some meaning to the, to this. The, you'll notice Ibrahim Musa and Farid Isak. Uh, and Fazl Rahman all show up on the right, some of these modern thinkers on the right, because they tend to use similar vocabularies, right? That's why they're all clustered in brown. Uh, but still, it's a little unwieldy. So I said, well, okay, let's just get the most common terms that are you occur with Quran and hermeneutics, uh, and so see if I can identify just a few main discourses that I want to pursue. And sure enough, the terms cluster fairly well. Here we have in yellow things relating to al-khas, well, al-am wal khas, uh, general and particular expressions. We've got commands and prohibitions over there in green. We have theories of speech in blue. So, okay, now show me who writes on those things. Aha, okay, now we've got something we can work with. We've got a bunch of Mu'tazilite and Hanafi thinkers who only, in my notes, right, in my small textual corpus, only wrote about general expressions, but we have other figures in the middle who wrote about theories of speech, clarity and ambiguity, commands. Um, since my data was structured data, I could tell who cited whom on these questions. So sh I created a, net a, uh, a, a network map of who cites whom the most. And this was particularly interesting because the algorithm, I had not provided the visualization tool with any information about the school affiliations of these figures. But as you might have guessed, although I wouldn't have said this was surefire, but it turns out they do cite each other within their schools much more than across school lines. So we've got it turns out we've got Hanbalis in blue up on the right, Hanafis in yellowish brown on the right. Uh, we've got in red, we've got almost all uh, Mu'tazilis, some Asharis and Shafis in the middle in pink and purple. We've got Malikis and Aqua up here. Um, and, and, and you can see, for instance, like Azarkashi in red down there is not a Mu'tazili, but at least this tells me, oh, if I want a non-Mu'tazili 
authors, citing Mu'tazili authors, I should look at him first, right, because he's clearly involved in the Mu'tazili networks. Uh, I also ran some chronological things. Let's see, of those five discourses, clarity, commands, et cetera, you know, how did those, in my, in my note cards, how did those develop over time? And you can see the commands in green were important early on and then much later in the discourse. Um, or <laughs> how about citations over time? So this is a, just made with, the, with Excel, actually, a stacked graph in Excel showing figures and the number of times they were quoted or cited in my note cards. Um, Shafi in pink is quoted early on and frequently throughout, but other figures, like the red Maltesili figures here, some of them are early figures, but they don't start to be quoted very much until the mid-11th century, at least in my little, little universe of, uh, of works. I also tried this, uh, looking at one figure and who quotes him. So here are all the people in my note cards who quote a Shafi, the different topics they quote them on, the different works that deal with those topics. And then if I want to focus in on one work, like the Risala here is fairly important on general expressions and clarity and ambiguity of language, well, a word cloud certainly is one way to get a sense of what's in a work, or a word trends graph with buoyant tools, show you which of these topics appear, how much, and where in the work. I've actually been using buoyant tools here to help me work on a little project. I'm making an argument that the, the Risala was actually composed in three stages, as effectively three separate works sort of, and uh, looking at vocabulary shifts between the three sections was, uh, was quite useful. Okay, those, um, so those were some of the things I found I could do with my little textual corpus of notes. What if I could do that with all those works out there that are available or at least cataloged in libraries that I am never going to have time to read and get this kind of visual landscape? Okay, and of course the librarian thinks it's not just Islamic studies, this is for anybody, right? So. Um, so we're developing this tool to try to do that. It's a lot more clunky, the visualizations aren't as nice, but um, so here I've got a search for just, just 100 results um, on Quranic hermeneutics. There are some settings here. We've worked with WorldCat Bibliographic Database, our library's database, and then we included also a bunch of Arabic texts, about 2,000 Arabic texts out of al Maktab al-Shamila. We don't have those, this is about the third interface, and we don't have those hooked into this interface yet, so they aren't really here, a number of other settings. But once you do a search here, you can, you can zoom in and look at the, the term space you've got here and decide to, uh, you know, if you, well, that's not a very interesting term. If you t click on commentaries here, we can see we've got a few works out of these 100 works that deal with commentaries. We can sort of zoom in and see, if, uh, see what some of those are if we, Quranic Hermeneutics at Tabrisi in the Craft of Commentary by Bruce Fudge, okay. Um, this one also, I think, was highlighted. Or we can look down here at the, at the authors, zoom around here. The, we, can, we can add, this does cumulative searches, so uh, the Quranic sciences, Uluma Quran, are fairly uh, relevant for Quranic Hermeneutics, so if we add those into the picture, what do we, what do we get? It's searching here, and we've Okay, now we've got 200 results, you can see here. And our term space, I think, just regenerated itself there. And then certainly, oh, okay, the author space, and there's a text space, they've regenerated themselves. So we can, <laughs> look here, we've got uh, Al-Iqan. Al-Iqan is the title of many books on Ulum al-Quran, Ulum is here. If we click Ulum here, we can see that, okay, all the works in Ulum have now been, on Ulum al-Quran have been clustered down here together. We can take a look at those titles, um, see the, the authors are spread all over the map, so they must have written about other things. That's, we've got a bigger, a larger uh, interface here that where well, you can see a bigger picture, work with it a little more easily. Uh, we can turn off the works and stuff and just focus on the, on the terms here. So here's our Ulum and Al-Athqan here. So uh, 14 out of 200 works uh, shown on the left here involve that. And then if we want to add back in the works here, we can see the titles that cluster around those. We can add back in the authors. We also have some other buttons up here that will allow us to exclude some of these terms that, like Islam, I really don't want to be 
that matters not at all. All of these works probably involve Islam. Or synonyms, we, we haven't implemented this yet, but it's going to be terribly important. I've got 15 different spellings of Quran in here, for instance. And then the, when you work across languages, we'll have to automate, using translation engines, automate some basic uh, synonyms. Um, and then, most importantly, we're creating... This is a landscape that's generated by the algorithms, but we want the user to be able to manipulate that landscape. And so I'm going to drop a pin in here, like on Google Maps, right, and say, this is the center of the works on the Quranic sciences. Drop a pin called the Quranic sciences and say, I'm going to identify it with ulum and Quran, with the several terms that are common in there, and then have the algorithm say, okay, any works that use a number of those terms, we're going to magnetize them, so they shift toward that pin on the map. Or I could identify specific works or specific authors that I know or can tell from the titles are involved in that discourse. And then when I click over that, say highlight that pin here, if that were a pin, I would see only the items that I have designated as part of that discourse connected to it. So, so you actually be able to modify this computer-generated landscape to sort of create, well, really to create the outline of my next book. You know, as I'm looking at all these texts on modern chronic hermeneutics, what are the discourses I need to deal with? If I start to sort those out and create pins, um, it's, it's an exploratory tool um, to allow me to map out what I need to do in my next research project, really. Um, we'll be able to manage those synonyms, exclusions, groups and stuff from this interface as well. Notice there's also a login button here, so if I... Um, log into my account here, it's going to open up this top window for me and load back up some previous results. Right? So be able to save my universe that I'm working on. And then, interestingly, um, be able to share the universe I'm working on with other users. So if Elias here keeps searching for tafsir and getting sets of terms that look like mine, the vision here ultimately is that he'll get a little notification that, or a list on the sidebar over here of other relevant assets, like my, my pins I've dropped, or my search results, I've, the searches I've run, the search results I've retrieved, the sets of synonyms I've created, which uh, you know, would be a bit of pain to create, probably. And he'll, be able to, and he'll be able to say, OK, try those out on top of your search. Use his synonyms and his pins and see how your search results are modified, your, your landscape's modified by, by, uh, by incorporating David Vishenoff's assets. That's the, that's the vision here. Um, obviously, the interface has still got a long way to go before it looks like those other visualizations, which frankly were much more compelling visually, um, more useful visually. We, we also need to work a little more on the algorithms, the clustering algorithms. I'm not sure they're, they're working all that well yet, though maybe they will be when we get more text, full text databases hooked in. We're working with Hathi Trust to get access to their full text databases. Um, the Alexandrian Library apparently has an API we can use to, to access their, include their uh, recent modern Arabic works that they have OCR'd there. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and then the other thing we need to do is get it working and stable enough so that you all can sign up and start using it too, so we can create a, a community of users in um, within the field of Islamic studies and, and beyond, right? It's not this, nothing is particularly Islamic about this because you can, the point of this is you can hook in whatever databases, you can write a few lines of code with their API to, to learn to search their databases. You can com combine multiple online text databases and, and you just need somebody at your institution who's willing to write a few lines of code to connect to the database you need. Now that may be trickier sometimes than you anticipate, copyright issues, et cetera, but, but eventually the Exaptive, the Exaptive is going to go open source soon, and the, the, the whole platform on which this is built, this is just one application of the broader Exaptive platform for research software. And once it's open source, we hope that libraries will, will bother to write their own little lines of code, their own plug-in, so that if you want, when you go to their website at the Alexandrian Library, you just say, oh, download the Exaptive plug-in and tie, tie that into your Zap, <laughs> your Zap, and, uh, and there you go, you'll have access, because the, the, the owners will be the best people to write these little, little plugins. This is distant reading, right? This is not close reading. Right? This is for discovery, for sorting out what's out there, for getting some hypotheses about connections. Ultimately, it might show us, it's going to be a little trickier, but show us who's citing whom. We can do entity extraction on these texts, identify the proper names, and uh, 
use the virtual international authority files to connect multiple versions of names and link them so the automatic synonyming of different forms of names and stuff. So eventually, we hope it will be able to show you who's citing whom, networks of, of scholarship that way. Um, give you some, some hypotheses about discourses that are out there and how they're interrelated. And really, f for me, just give me a, a bit of a guide as to what book do I read next. In the end, I have to come back and do some close reading. But what do I read when there's all this mountain of stuff out there? And which, which books should I read together? Should I read Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid and this Indonesian thinker, or this Indonesian thinker and Arkun, or, or whoever? Uh, and, and this should tell me which of those are most likely to be connected. It's suggestive, not definitive. This software will never prove anything, right? But it, it will give you some research strategies. So um, if you want to, you can't sign, you can't log in and use it yet because you wouldn't want to. It's way too, it would be way too frustrating. It's constantly changing every day. I'm glad it still works today the way it did yesterday. <laughs> um, and, and it's very clunky and all. And, and, uh, but, so it would be frustrating to give you a link now to try to use it. But, uh, but within a month or two, we hope to have a beta version that's stable enough you could use it. So if you go to this link, you can put in your name and email address, and then you'll get that email so that you'll know when it's available and you can start to use it. And we'll see how much catalyzation, what greater transparency, what, what the results are when a, when a community of users start to use it and choose to share their assets and their work and their research universes with, with others. This course is not limited to Islamic studies, but it's kind of exciting to see this starting in Islamic studies, helping to lead our field, helping to lead the way. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, David. Um, since he didn't mention it, I think I will mention it since we have a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, when the first time I met um, Professor Vishenov at the time, I was a, a lowly graduate student attending my first um, American Oriental Society meeting, and we were sitting at the same table for the dinner. It was, was it AOS or Mesa? Yeah, it was, it was AOS. AOS, yeah. And um, we got to talking, and I was working on my dissertation at the time, which was about one of these huge texts, uh, 2.3 million words, Mamluk Encyclopedia. And um, he had mentioned that he had found the use of access databases useful in his own research, just as a way of kind of sorting um, those enormous tables of notes that he had mentioned. And he very kindly, and I said, that would be a great way for me to make sense of this huge encyclopedia that I was uh, working on. And he very kindly shared that database with me, which is something that um, we're not very good at yet, I think, uh, people who work in the digital humanities. Although we're probably better at it than people who are not digital humanists sharing our methodologies. But I was very grateful to him. I didn't end up using it, but it was quite inspiring to see somebody um, making use of uh, computational tools um, to uh, really make sense of enormous quantities of um, data. And we didn't have like a fancy name to call it. We didn't, we didn't call ourselves digital humanists a decade ago, at least not in Middle East studies. We just were like, you know, nerds with, um, Problems, basically. Okay, so um, Peter Verkinderen is a research associate at the University of Hamburg on the ERC project, The Early Islamic Empire at Work, The View from the Regions Towards the Center. He is presenting today on behalf of himself and two colleagues, Jose Antonio Haro Peralta and Hanna Lena Hageman. Their talk is entitled, Which Muhammad? Computer-Based Tools for the identification of moving elites in the early Islamic empire. And Peter is one of, um, Peter and Jose are the authors of one of the articles in that volume that you have the uh, introductory essay for, uh, which has been very useful already to me and quite a few other people because it um, explains, it, it lays out a, a, a um, technique for context-based search uh, using Python. And so if you're just getting up and running in Python, um, I highly recommend taking a look at that. Okay, Peter.
So yeah, it's very nice to be here again. Uh, uh, last year, uh, I was here as well. This year was in fact uh, my colleague Jose who was supposed to be here, but he couldn't make it. So I got the chance to come again. So it's nice to be here again. Um, like Elia said, um, we are. Uh, I'm working in a project that look that is called. Um, oh, maybe I should put this into presentation mode first. It's called the Early Islamic uh, Empire at Work. Um, we are currently looking at identifying individuals, families, and occupational groups who are considered part of the elite of the Early Islamic Empire during the first three centuries of Islam. And we do this for five different regions um, in the empire, Ifriqiya, Sham, um, Al Jazeera, Fars, and Khurasan. I'm I'm doing uh, the Fars uh, chapter. Um, so traditionally, you would just look. Uh, it would go into um, uh, the the main um, biographical works, the main uh, historical works, and try to list these people. But um, yeah, we all know it's a huge amount of data. Our project is only five years. So it's we w we were facing the problem that uh, yeah we would never be able to finish this in five years, especially because we wanted to go behind uh, beyond the usual usual suspects. Um, so we would we would like to look for these elites not just in uh, the historiographical text, not just in the biographical text, but find them anywhere. So. Um, we, we start to develop these tools um, um, to look, to make more of um, the digital texts that are available. So, um, yeah, we know, all know there's a lot of digital texts available, but we found that the tools were not really um, useful, in fact, for what we wanted to do. So we, uh, yeah, we, des we made this uh, first, uh, uh, toolbox that's, uh, that we presented a little bit last year in the here at the conference, and um, we um, yeah it's now available um, online for for use. You can uh, download it there. Um, yeah, it's a very long <laughs> link. So you just uh, you can just Google Jedly toolbox, and you can play around with it. So. Um, for for looking at elites and elite groups, we used um, one tool that's called uh, we call the context search, uh, and which uh, so you look for a word and you limit the results by um, creating a kind of um, semantic net to catch out the uh, the results that interest you. Um, um, I'll give an example. Um, okay, so it's made by uh, using Python. Um, so what we do is first we look at a sample text. Um, I'll take, for example, here um, the Qadis of the city of, Mo of Mosul. And so we, we look at a couple of texts that mention these, these Qadis. And we look which, which words are signaling to us that this piece of text is talking about Khadi of Mosul, and we, we list these words. Um, and then, um, so yeah, this would be, for example, for Khadi, this would be the words that, that are interesting. Um, and then, so you just make a search for uh, Mosul, and um, you get, for example, a thousand results, and then for every result you look if one of these words is in the context of a number of words around this. Um, so this gives you something like this. Um, so you get here uh, more than 1,300 uh, results, and then uh, 21 of these um, probably mention a Qadi of Mosul. So then you, so you have to manually then go to, through the results to um, make a list 
of these persons. And then we get to what I wanted to present here. Um, so we got into trouble after, after for the next step. Because we, we don't just want a list of, of Qadis. We want to know who these people were, um, who they are connected to, what their background is, these kind of things. Um, So first we thought, okay, no problem, we just do the same thing. We just run a search on these names, but then you get into trouble, of course. Um, because, yeah, you know how uh, Islamic names are difficult. They, are, they consist of different parts. They can switch places. You have different versions. Sometimes you, uh, you get a very long uh, list of patronyms. Sometimes you don't. So it's not so easy to search uh, these people. And even if you, if you find them results, it's not so easy to know, like, is this the person I'm looking for? Is this Ahmed ibn Muhammad? The Ahmed ibn Muhammad I'm looking for. So which Muhammad? That's uh, the basic question. So we're we... All looking, we're all looking for that guy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so... Um, we, we, de we designed like a basic procedure of what we wanted to do. So first we want to just find all the Muhammad ibn Ahmad, let's say, um, and then we want to filter them. Um, first, we want to, to see like which names are closer, more similar to the, the name of the person we are looking for. And then we want to analyze the context around these names and see if we can um, rank these, these uh, results on uh, similarity. So if it's an Ahmad ibn Muhammad who lives in the fifth century, it's not the same, probably not the same one as the one we are looking for who was Qadi in Mosul in the second century. The same if he lived in uh, North Africa, it's less likely, can still be, that this is the one who, uh, who was in Mosul. And we can also look at other persons that are connected to him. So if you know Ahmad ibn Muhammad was um, often in, in different contexts related to um, a specific, uh, um, let's say, use of uh, 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 Hindi, then um, if this use of Hindi turns up in the result, then it's probably our uh, Ahmad ibn Muhammad. So this, was, um, this is what we want. <laughs> Now, uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting close. So the first part, uh, I'm just going to go through these uh, three steps and um, show some of the difficulties we run into. So the first problem with the names, there's a lot of uh, ways to write an Arabic name. So, um, yeah, so our first idea was, okay, we're going to try to deal with this by using regular expressions, our favorite tool. Um, but very fast, you run into trouble because there's so much elasticity, as we call it in these names. So you have to build in a lot of uncertainties and this leads to, um, very complex um, regular expressions, a lot of false positives, and becomes super slow if you have to go through a lot of text. So we thought first, okay, first things first, we, we try to make it faster um, by making a pre-selection of all the names in a text so that, you re um, that the bulk of text that you have to analyze is much smaller uh, we're just going to run the analysis of names on the names, which makes, makes sense. You're not checking every word with this, with this uh, regular expression. Um, to do that, um, we build lists of Arabic names. Now, there are, of course, lists of Arabic names around, but we decided to build our, the list ourselves. So we just start with one name, Muhammad. Um, 
and we looked at first just in one source in at Ansabul Ashraf, we just look at all the uh, fathers of Muhammad. So we looked at Muhammad ibn X. And so we got all the uh, fathers of Muhammad. Okay, and of course you have to take into account that the patronym can be can consist of two parts, of three parts even. So you have to take this into account. But at least if you do this, you get a list of fathers of Muhammad. And then all these fathers of Muhammad, you do exactly the same. So you make a circle and until you get all the names in the in the text that are somehow uh, um, yeah you this these are not just isms they are also uh, kunyas and nisbas so it's a mix um, but you can easily filter the kunyas and the isms out of course because yeah, they have a very typical pattern um, and so you can just repeat this and repeat this in different works until you get the, sat uh, the sat saturation point. So, and that was quite fast. In fact, after like 10, 10 works or so, we got to the separation, uh, saturation point. Um, and then based on these uh, lists of isms, we built lists of kunyas, lists of nisbas, and lists of lachabs on more or less the same way. So you just take one name, uh, you build a pattern around it, and you just repeat it until it stops uh, finding new names. We also did this for women's names, but um, yeah, since there is not so many um, qadis of Muslims who are women, we're not really using it in this uh, in this context. So the next step is then trying to select all the names in a text um, so that we have just a much smaller uh, basis on which we have to do our analysis. Um, we, so first what we do is we take all these lists of isms and kunyas and nisbas that we made before, just put them all together in one big list and add terms like ibn and wahua and ma'ruf bi, uh, these kinds of things um, that connect uh, name elements together. And then uh, we just split the text into words and check for every word if it's in this list of name elements. Um, and then so you just go um, word by word if it's in the if it's in the list of name element, you set it aside. You go to the next word. If it is, you set it aside. Uh, you put it next to it, and so you build the name. Um, of course, it's not okay. This this is an example. Um, yeah, and then if you have um, a word that is not in the list, uh, you check if it's in the list. If you take out the first letter, if that could be an, a prefix, because that starts a new name. Um, of course, it's not so easy. Uh, some words consist of two or two or even three words. Uh, we tried a lot of different uh, ways to deal with this. I'm just going to skip over this. Uh, can talk about it later, maybe if you're interested in it. Um, but for us, the easiest solution in the end was just to split all the name elements into a single word. So you're looking for abs, for Allah, as separate uh, elements. And just in the end, just you disregard all the matches that consist of one word. So you have, uh, yeah. And this deals also with a lot of other problems. Like what you often have is um, you have rare names, uh, words that are most usually not names, but sometimes are names like Dinar, Jabal. Um, so, yeah. so you just uh, take these out by looking at only uh, names that uh, consist of more than one element. So the second uh, step 
in our uh, basic procedure was to filter these candidates. So we, now we have um, we have been able to take all the names out of a list of uh, uh, out of a text. So we have a list of all the names in the text, and now we want to uh, check which of these names are close to the name that we are looking for. Um, and the way we do it is by weighing the different name elements. So um, you can um, say that a specific element is more likely to identify your name as a relevant name. And so you can also try to, so there are two things you can <coughs> try to maximize the number of uh, real positives and minimize the number of false positives. So we have like a little uh, interface for this. Um, and you, so you can also introduce thresholds. So you can say um, it needs like every name that we check uh, that can go only in our list of results when it has minimum this uh, much points. So we give points to the, to the names. Something that's also important sometimes is the name order. Ahmed ibn Muhammad is not the same as Muhammad ibn Ahmed, but on the other hand, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Muhammad, Ahmed can be the same as Ahmed Abu Muhammad, of course. So you cannot uh, rule out that these are the same persons. So this works quite well. So you get lists of um, of similar uh, similar names, and then yeah. So then we we have a, a like we ourselves, the user, um, interacts and chooses which of these names are of interest. You can also choose, of course, to take all the all the results to go uh, to the next step, which is analyzing the context. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the interface. So you just get um, the number of results. So we're looking for Hassan Usman Ashab. And then you get um, the, uh, the weights and the, play and the books where they are from. Um, so yeah, you, so there are three things we try to do. One is filtering by dates. So for the moment, it works like this, that you have, um, uh, so we look at uh, years that are mentioned in the context. Um, First, I have to say, like, which context are you looking in? You can define that yourself. Of course, you can look at the number of characters, the number of words, the number of paragraphs. Um, so this, we look at the years. So we look at which um, years are mentioned in the context of uh, this person, of the results, and compare it with the, uh, the dates our person that we're looking for lived in. For places, we do the same. We have um, based on um, Cornu's atlas that was digitized by uh, um, uh, Maxime Romanov. Uh, we made a regional selection, so you can say this person lived in this region. And if um, a toponym from this region turns up in the results, um, you get alerted to this. And um, the next step, which we haven't really implemented yet, is looking at other persons' names. So you redo the, the same analysis uh, that we did in the first place in the context, and you look if persons turn up in these contexts that are related, that we know are related to the person we're looking for. So um, this is like not, I would say it's not really distant reading yet. It's the first step towards uh, distance reading, we are trying, I think, if 
time is up. <laughs> so we are trying to um, um, to get closer to that, but we are in between close reading and distant reading. In fact, we try to um, identify in interesting uh, contexts that we are then reading closer. Okay. Thank you. citation practices and to track scholarly trends currents as a, what you're doing um, in other fields or other corners um, especially of history has been quite uh, I mean it's been really enlightening but it's also been quite controversial and I'm thinking of uh, we have a wonderful professor at Brown uh, named Joe Gouldy who recently wrote a book um, along with um, David yeah. Armitage at, um, at Harvard it's called the History Manifesto, and part of um, their argument was that history, historical study is becoming more and more narrow, uh, and I mean, there was a lot of methodology that went into it, but I'll give you just one example. They went through um, dissertation titles published, you know, over the, I don't know how many decades, basically, and also, uh, so pulling from ProQuest, but also like, uh, I, think, I think they also looked at journal article Titles, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and looked at date ranges that appeared in those titles. And they showed that the date ranges for historical studies were becoming smaller and smaller. And they made this argument that you know, history needed to get back to a kind of long durée model, and it was an important. Um, uh, the historians are missing out on an opportunity to really uh, weigh in on, on issues, historical issues and processes that require a wide angle lens, you know, when you're dealing with things like climate change or massive political uh, processes, transformations, historians are uniquely capable, able, able to do that sort of thing. Um, the book, there was a lot of controversy generated by this book and there was sort of a backlash against it and, um, and that's a whole different issue, but um, I was curious to know whether you, if you could weigh in on, on the dimensions beyond an individual scholar's uh, Making use of this tool, um, if you if you could envision, like I, I could imagine a fantastic article in Journal of Chronic Studies or HMS or something that says like let's look at you know these different trends, scholarly trends over the past 30 or 40 years, uh, and you know that'd be like one of the most highly cited articles, and then that would have to of course be factored into the database itself, and um, I, I imagine there would be a lot of interest in that sort of thing. So here you're picturing, uh, yes, you're picturing using a, a tool like this to map out trends, not in the Islamic archive, but in the Islamic studies discipline. Islamicist archive, yeah. Yes. No, I had not, uh, I mean, I tend to think of those as sort of a, a continuum. Uh, Eric and I were talking about that last night, with including Henri Corbin in the study of Sohra Wardi, you know, in his, in his reception, right? Uh, but, uh, but, but certainly it would make sense. To, the, the tool's pretty open-ended in terms of, so you could, we, we really ought to include filters to just like set your date range, that's a no-brainer, right? Um, and how you sort out what you want to consider the Islamicist work, you could limit certain publishers perhaps, uh, that would work. Um, that would be the easiest way to do it. If you could certainly use it just as well to get a sense of to mapping the field of Islamic studies as a discipline over a certain time period just as easily as the discipline of uh, usul al-tafsir or something like that. Um, could you, what, 
could you show from that? Um, I think analyzing, say, the titles of works to try to get a sense of the breadth of scope of a work, um, that sounds like a somewhat different operation, but, but you could, I think, with the kinds of tools we're envisioning putting in here, that we've got in here, you could certainly map out, say, in the study, in the, in the study of Quranic hermeneutics, I think you would probably be able to see visually that scholarship by Western publishers in the last 30 years has focused on major thinkers you could count on your two hands. Whereas what this tool helps me realize is that there are hundreds and thousands of thinkers right, publishing very actively uh, who there's no secondary scholarship on them at all. So we probably discovered quite quickly that our canon of primary works that we're studying is very, very small and we're somewhat redundant in our studies. Um, what, what other things could one discover along those lines? What, do you, what else do you suspect one would discover if you could map the last 30 years of Islamic studies? Well, you'd see the, the Ibn Taymiyyah bulge, right? <laughs> yeah. You'd call that, you'd be like a... Yeah, you yeah. point to that and say, well, that's where that, and then, I mean, I think you'd see lots of things. Um, it, it would be tied, of course, to certain institutional developments. The emergence of a major journal, or a journal that became important. The emergence of, um, you know, somebody gets a job at, at an important place that trains doctoral students, and then 10 years later, you start seeing dissertations on in that field, you know. That's all really interesting, I think, uh, is a descriptive rather than an explanatory book. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Uh, and to add to that, it'd be interesting to compare regional variations, like European emphases versus American emphases versus in the Arab world or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the priorities of, I mean, we know that the, the editorial priorities in the Arab world are very different than the scholarly priorities, say, at you know, Harvard, Yale, etc. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to let you guys field your own questions. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. Well, actually, I was also responding to what Elias said and then coming to you. Oh, I think our problem would be the other way because um, the issue of becoming narrow and narrower seems to be something that afflicts American history, especially when they do uh, one or two days of, uh, or one or two hours of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg or something like that. But uh, we, we've been so broad for so long and we've had such broad mandates in teaching as well. So, and to see this sort of pinpointed work which you're trying to bring to this from all this broadness down to uh, being able to extract uh, uh, very specific uh, forms of data, I don't know whether to be more stressed out or to be happier because of course there is so many issues that both uh, Peter and uh, you have uh, highlighted with the work that you've done, especially Peter with the naming issues. We all struggle with it. And um, it's just interesting to see you develop these tools and the question of how does the how do these tools become uh, user friendly? Because right now they're not so user friendly. How you want to feel that. Yeah, if, if that's a question, um, yeah, I think First, we need to find ways to deal with these problems, and then you can try to model tools around them that are that are user friendly. I guess. Um, but most of the research that we've been doing in the last couple of months on this, uh, yeah, went into like, running into problems. In fact, and that's I think the first step. You run into the limits of what you can do in a certain way, so you have to find another way to do it. And then once you have a way that really works well and fast and correctly, <coughs> then, you, then you can start building a tool around it. So for now, it's still, it's not at the tool stage yet, let's say. I'll just add that your tool is a very specialized tool of trying to get really real hard results out of texts. And my tool is on the other end of the spectrum here. It's something that is going to be developed if we're able to keep getting funding for this. Well, the exactor is going to keep developing it, whether or you help them or not. Uh, that will be open source, and they'll try to make it such that 
something like your algorithms, you could put them into an, a, a plug-in for Exaptive so that people using different data sets from yours could, uh, could when I do my entity extraction on um, Alexandrian libraries, uh, modern Arabic works, before, just put that plug-in in, before you map out who all these figures and authors are, run this algorithm on it to determine more precisely which people are being referred to. Um, I think one of the problems we have in digital humanities is that our tools tend to be data set specific. And that's great, but the, what the adaptive platform offers is a way to make tools shareable and useful across data sets. Um, now, but, and in fact, I suppose the incorporation of such tools would make the results from something like this Zap more trustworthy, but you still got something that's taking a very broad brush look at things, and a lot of the, the associations it's going to suggest between works will be spurious. Yeah, whereas in your case, you're really trying to avoid spurious results very carefully. I think in the back first. Oh, I just, uh, I was wondering whether, um, Coming off of this project, and especially working with Maxime, who's been so interested in making like a place name gazetteer, have you guys been considering creating, as you go through this project, creating more of a human curated name gazetteer, a sort of ordered, structured data that somebody could look up, like talking about the better interfaces, right? I mean, this is not a problem for me. But I don't know. I'm not a historian. I mean, Yonatan or linguists were just slumming it in here, I guess. Um, uh, or the other way around. Uh, but would it be helpful to have a name gazetteer where you you get a name, you could get some hits with this much more nicely structured data and start to use that to feed into one another? Because it sounds like you're doing that in a lot of that work anyway. If you had some sort of structured format, like geo names, but Arab names or whatever, yeah. um, hmm. I wonder if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think it would definitely be helpful. And this is something that we want to take out of the work that we have done before already, just publish these lists of names, uh, and not just names, but the different name elements, so Nisbas, uh, Kunyas, Blockhops, these kind of things, and then anyone can use them for whatever they want, and we can also make like, um, a an online database to which people can add names, and I think that would be very useful in fact. I'm wondering about the question of evaluation of the, the performance of some of these tools, so yeah. especially with tools that have some component of human engineering, like uh, weight schemes and some rules and heuristics. It, I guess it's hard to know sometimes how well they perform. And one way is to just look as you go along uh, in your research and see if it's helpful. Uh, I could suggest, you know, another way would be to have some manually annotated data set or corpus and then test your tools on that. Or a different way could be a user study that shows. So I'm just wondering if you have considered any of those uh, approaches or other ways to evaluate. I guess it's for any tool um, that is used. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not so easy. Like what we do. Now to test it is we create um, a fake text that we know it has these these names in it and it needs to return them in this order. It needs to find all of them. That's and it should not return these and obviously. But this is one way we test it. Uh, but it's not watertight of course. Um, so yeah, I am open to any other suggestions also. But uh, you're right, testing these kind of things is it's not easy because you're in our way. You always create your own data set, but you overlook problems uh, that that may turn up in, in real text, real life text. Yeah. So you want a test set that is sort of diverse and not very specific to your domain, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Sure. Whereas in my case, heuristic value is the only test we're interested in. So, Well, well you can always have some users, user study that shows how benefit it is. So, because even in your case, you can tweak the 
uh, UI and the program in different ways, and you're not sure what is helpful or not. So, um, you know, if you have a maybe a large or medium scale user study that tell, tells you this tweak is better than this one, that's also a sort of an evaluation. And there's still issues of, I mean, you said that your algorithm, you're still trying to fix the algorithm, things like that, to get it to associate certain texts and words together. I mean, so even that is an issue of calibration and measurement. And the basic approach example is taking here is to make multiple algorithms available to the users mm -hmm. and have users try out algorithms and then they'll track which algorithms users end up sticking with. And if people in the Islamic studies stick with algorithm A and people in the classics stick with algorithm B, well, they'll suggest those algorithms to users in those fields. It's really a sort of a survival of the survival of fittest <laughs> approach to, to testing. Also, the question, um, how did you decide upon the executive uh, platform for this? I mean, you mentioned that it was kind of a conversation with the founder. I mean, are there other platforms out there that you were thinking of, or is this just uh, kind of serendipity? Well, for me, it's serendipity. Um, but fortunately, our, our library, uh, Dave King, the leader of Exaptive, and our library folks are both quite in tune with all the tools that are out there. There are a lot of tools for business that try to incorporate different, multiple types of data and give you visual results. And our librarians are very aware of the cutting edge stuff in, in library development. Uh, so they're, they're having to s survey that field for me. I, I don't know enough about it. Uh, the, the reason the library was excited about using the Exaptive platform for this is that it's not just designed to create a research tool for somebody. It's, it's a platform in which everybody can customize their own research tool. And, uh, and as, as soon as it goes open source, then uh, they, they hope to generate lots of research tools being developed. And while doing some meta-level some meta tracking of what people are doing so that they can evaluate what methods, visualizations, algorithms, data sets to suggest to other users. And I think the librarians are particularly excited about that potential of the platform. Um, I'm just for both of you, I'm just curious in your guys' work on these tools, were there any particular <coughs> technical challenges that you confronted because of working with Arabic script, and how, if there were, how did you address them? And, well, um, our main issue is the, um, the, um, the, um, the, um, the programs we use to write the, uh, the code, um, have problems with displaying uh, Arabic in non-Arabic context, so like, everything starts jumping around. Um, but there are a couple of ways around it. We, if it's really irritating us, then we just replace them by like placeholders. Replace the Arabic parts by placeholders, and then that works quite well. Um, and yeah, that that's in fact the main problem that, that we faced. Because everything works quite well, but Unicode now in Python. I'm hopeful that because Unicode and the operating systems are getting better at handling switching between texts, I'm hopeful that our developers, now I'm not a programmer at all, right? so I'm a different role from you. My role in helping push these technical challenges is to keep reminding the, the developers every week Remember to be trying some Arabic text in here. I sent you some snippets of Arabic text. You know, remember to be trying it because if it's not working with that, it's not working, right? And they keep working with Latin text, and I keep, you know, I just have to keep prodding them to make sure that this thing doesn't get developed and then be useless for Islamists. Uh, I just wanted to comment on your, on your tool again. I thought it, uh, it looked really interesting. Um, you mentioned making results available to other people. And uh, I would just put in a word for making sure that there's permissions. Um, I think especially for younger scholars or junior scholars, um, I would be very nervous to allow my results to be seen. So for example, I, I have a 
a project where I, um, it's a way to search for the diversity of Arabic dialects. It's a website, right? Anyone can add to it. Um, but uh, obviously, I have, I'm have i using it a lot for the data for a book I'm writing. And so I've made all the data that, on a single datum level, um, all that data that's not in my dissertation, a giant appendix at the end, private. And the stuff from my dissertation is in the appendix at the end, public, why not? Right? So there's something on there when people want to search and look at it. Um, but I think that it would be important. Like, I wouldn't want my analysis of all these sources that I've put a lot of time into to suddenly show up to somebody else if that's, if that's the, the frame or skeleton of my upcoming book. Um, and one other, other thing, you talked about synonyms. You should check out uh, Google, well, originally Google's Open Refine. It has some really nice tools for clumping stuff together. Has a really nice interface. You might want to think about that when you're thinking about the interface for how to handle this. Things like Quran being spelled different ways. It has a lot of clustering tools like that. And you could maybe take some inspiration from that. Okay. Yeah. The uh, the synonyms is something that I keep. One of those things I keep reminding the developers that this tool is useless as soon as you've got two languages in it because. That works in one language, you're going to cluster on one side of the map, and it works in another language, it's going to cluster on the other side. They have no vocabulary overlap. So it's useless until we get the synonyming and some automation of synonyming in there. I keep reminding them of that, but they, they're not humanities scholars, and I have to keep pushing that. Uh, so we'll definitely look at, look at that, because they're, we certainly want that to be powerful. But your first point is really interesting, um, and I think there are two sides to it. One is, as Exaptive develops, they will have to let people set their own levels of sharing. They just have to, right? Because commercial users aren't going to share very much. We scholars are going to share more, but still, we're going to, there's, you know, when I said, maybe asked my database years ago, there are notes in that database, I hope he never reads, where I'm saying, this guy is totally saying nonsense here, you know, and, and, and I'm probably wrong in that note, because it's just my initial impression, right? So I don't really want all those things out there. Um, so yes, we'll have to let users set their own, what they're going to share and what they're not going to share. My list of synonyms aren't going to help, you know, that's just helping people, right? Uh, but my pins, the discourses I'm identifying, hmm, that's, for, that's the book chapter list for my next book, you know. But then the other side of this is that I think the, the advent of digital technologies to the humanities forces on us the pot potential to be more transparent and more collaborative and more vulnerable to criticism. People see my research universe, they can come back in and say, hey, you kind of deliberately ignored this and it was right in front of you. Um, and, and I think actually it would be good for us to feel to be pushed in that direction. Even though individually, of course, all our instincts react against it. So I, um, I, I, I thought of even sh showing you here because I've been working on this digital humanities project, I'm starting to think about this. The next, the next book I was likely to publish was just a little textbook. It was a translation, a critical edition translation, and then my own commentary upon a very short medieval legal theory text, of which, on which this is like the 100th or 200th commentary written on this text. Now we have a sort of postmodern <laughs> Western commentary on it. And that was going to be a little textbook I was going to publish. But I never quite got around, I never got around to polishing it. I just decided to put it up on the web as a rough draft with a space for other people to add their commentaries and respond to my commentary. And I, there are probably things in there I really still don't want people to read. And there are also in there my own notes to myself about what I need to improve. But I said, well, I, you know, it's going to be a better book at the end of the day if I get people telling me you're all wet on this, you know, if anybody pays attention to it. Um, I think. It, it's easier. I've already got tenure, right? It's a little, it's a little easier, but um, but I think it's a, it's good for us to be pushed in that direction. Well, I, I, um, I the, the approach I took uh, in my uh, database, which is written in like spare moments, and then making sure I didn't break it, so it's not developing super fast. But I I did a collaborator collaborator model, so I can say you are my collaborator. It's one way, so I can let you see my data without you seeing my without switching the other way, unless you unless you do that. And it reminds me of what Academia.edu has done recently, which is allowed um, sessions on rough drafts, mm -hmm. where you 
you choose who you allow to see it, you invite them, and then they can, if they've been invited, are allowed to come comment on things, and that's actually been really, I found that tool to be very useful. But again, I like, especially as a junior scholar, I would want to limit it to people I don't trust a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm glad this is getting raised yet. This is an important question to talk about, especially in the digital age, um, because we do have access to a lot of information, and the question is, do we um, allow that un unimpeded access, or do we put up block blocks along the way? Um, and it's something that's come up in my work as well, and I, I'm glad we're starting this discourse, actually. It's very useful. I'd also add that the temptation to share is high, right? I mean, I just did the presentation. We have a bunch of nice slides here, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we're nowhere near publication ready stage, but we've done a lot of grunt work that's taken a lot of effort. And if somebody can, it's tempting to share that because I want people to see what I'm doing to look mm -hmm. active, even if it's not a full publication, get some feedback. But then it gets a little iffy if that's online and any schmuck can come and see it. And, then be like, oh, that's a great idea, I'll do it, and publish. <laughs> you know, it, it gets a little, it feels a little iffy sometimes. Can you make your tool schmuck-proof? That would be great. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? We have some more time. We have about five more minutes. Uh, this question from Peter, just uh, uh, on, on the tool. So is that, uh, what, what kind of, uh, you said that it's available for use, uh, available for download online. What uh, is it uh, uh, friendly to non-Arabic corpus? Um, no, for like, for the moment, it works basically only with text from uh, Maktaba Shamla because we are looking, we are using for the moment um, an indexing function that looks at the, the, the page numbers that are in a specific form. I mean, you can. Put every every uh, any any book in, in the in the list of uh, of sources that you want to uh, search, but you have to make sure that it's formatted in the same, that the page numbers are formatted in the same way. That's the only thing. Uh, but you, uh, we, it's really only for Arabic for now. But we are planning to make it. And um, and for in case of Arabic, does it work for texts where you might want to? Uh, go by line numbers and not by page numbers. I'm thinking in terms of poetry, where you know, page numbers wouldn't matter. You're thinking of like the line of poem, poems that you want to look at, like uh, particularly because you know the, you're doing context search. So if you want to look at sort of two tropes uh, in relation to each other, that's a very useful sort of tool, context search for that. Uh, so the, uh, but then for poetry, you probably need a, a line or a verse numbering rather than a page numbering. Does, is it open to that for now or uh, no? for now the, the tool is it's published like this not I but you can um, like it's the, it's totally open source so you, oh, it can, is open you can just take uh, all the code that we write and instead of the page number you look for yeah like something else so you can modify it but for now it's really working only with the page number as it's provided what is it developed in the tool sorry uh, the tool what what is in Python anxieties is the specter of manuscript over all, all of these programs because we sort of assume that print is universal and includes it, but of course there, there's a massive gap. And I don't know what to say to, to Peter about that, but, but to David, I wonder to what extent you could include, you could grab library entries for titles or names of authors or, or copyists or whatever. And of course, it won't get into the distant reading, it can't get into the text. But when we're at least, there'll be layers that when we're doing searches uh, of authors or, or titles or, or relations, we can still see some of these connections between, between manuscript and print. And, and as, as scholars looking for things to read, we will be made aware of libraries with unique things that we should pursue if we can get a digital scan of it or something like that. Maybe some of the librarians in the room could tell us, do most libraries, when they have a manuscript collection, they catalog them, do they include those in their in their full library catalog, or do you have to go to such that those titles and basic information 
would be included, say, I don't think I'm seeing them in WorldCat, for instance. I mean, they are, some are, there are manuscripts in WorldCat. I mean, some there libraries some. do put their manuscripts uh, into the WorldCat. Yeah, yeah. But Amer American ones do. I mean, like, the British Library doesn't, okay. which is a scandal. <laughs> they have a phenomenal collection. The Dutch do. They're pretty thorough. And it, and it also depends on whether it's a complete manuscript or you have three folios of some larger right. work, you know, you know, two pages of a Shaname or three pages of some tafsir text or something like that. So two, two things. For this particular tool, if you really want, if a particular user really wants to know about some manuscript collections, the beauty of Exaptive is it's, it's sort of a, a plug, a plug-in system. And you can say, well, OK, I'm going to figure out how to use the British Library's manuscript collection search interface and tie that in to make sure I'm getting those results. But it would be better if they were putting them into WorldCat or something so that everybody could see those results. The other, the other thing you bring up is the issue of selectivity. It's not just print, it's digitized print. right? That, and so this, if you plan your next research project using this zap, you're going to be focusing more on things that happen to have been digitized, which is not neutral. right? Mm -hmm. Especially for the Islamic community, as opposed to maybe the classicists. Yeah, yeah. But I think my so yeah, it's not a it's not. But we've always had canons, right? The stuff the stuff we're going to research primarily so far has been dictated by what prior scholars have sort of canonized as the main text in Islamic studies, right? So we've always had a canon, and this at least will stretch that canon some. But it's not a universal map by any means. I guess it's also easier to uh, do that kind of an analysis on catalogs, particularly difficulties we have with OCRs because a lot of it, a lot of manuscripts that we have in digital form are images, and OCR is not at the stage where everything can, you know, particularly with non nasr scripts, can become. So uh, for catalogs which are of Arabic or non Arabic manuscripts, which are in English or in German or in other languages for which you can do OCRs. That kind of a map is, is what can be very useful. Mm -hmm. One more comment, question? Coffee. <laughs> okay, coffee. Thank you.